another set of qualities of bakula. Okay, since in the 80 years since he went forth, or since I went forth, he says, I do not recall ever having accepted an invitation to a meal, ever having given rise to the thought or the wish, oh, may someone invite me to a meal, ever having sat down inside a house, that is a house of lay people, ever having eaten a meal inside a house, Okay, now for the monastic order, there are various ways that the Buddha has laid down for the monastics to receive their meals. Okay, one way is to stay at the monastery, then lay people will bring food to the monastery and then offer the food in the monastery to the monks, monks and nuns. Another way, which is sort of the ideal way, held up as a model by the Buddha himself, is to go on alms round. That is to take the alms bowl, to go from house to house, just standing quietly in front of each house a few minutes, waiting until people will come out, and then if they wish to offer the food, they will offer food into the bowl of the monk. And then a third way, is for lay people to invite the monastics to come to the house for a meal. And usually, <laughs> well, from a worldly monastic way of thinking, it's when you get the invitation to the meal that sort of the mind lights up. Ah, delicious food today. Don't have to go from house to house wedding, you're subject to the heat of the sun, maybe abuse, get away from here, you bald-headed beggar. Um, and then maybe you're getting just leftover food from the day before. And even when people bring food to the monastery, they might just cook in a rather casual and routine way. When people invite the monks to the house, they usually make special effort to prepare the most delicious food with the greatest diversity and rich in flavors. And so <laughs> those monks who give a lot of attention to the food that they like will make effort to get invitations to the houses for the meals. Whereas those who want to uphold the ascetic ideal will deliberately refuse to accept invitations and insist on always going on alms round, except if they're sick, then they will remain at the monastery and either fellow monk <coughs> monks who go on alms round will share the food with them or lay people can bring to the monastery to provide the food. Excuse me? Who? Oh. No. No. No, no, no. First, he's, he didn't say that he... There's nothing that says he didn't wear clothes. No. I mean, this was a practice that... Mahavira... I think Mahavira was a, a naked ascetic. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say that it's mixed up because, you know, there's a lot of testimony that Bakula was an arahat and he's esteemed by the, in the Sangha and at least according to the records of the, the sutta, the commentaries, they're all confirmed that he was a disciple of the Buddha. But I'd say that this, his behavior sort of reflects the spirit, the spirit that also under, was underlying the Jain practices and other practices of the period. Yeah.
Yeah, let, let's hold that question off to the, to the end. So let me continue so that we can complete the sutta. <laughs> okay, so he's never given rise to the thought, may somebody invite me to a meal. He's never even entered a house. You know, sometimes lay people might invite the monks not to a meal, but to come into the house, either to recite blessings or to receive a cup of tea. I don't know that they had tea in the time of the Buddha, but to accept some refreshment in the afternoon. So he's never even sat down inside a house and never even eaten a meal inside a house. And again, this is, the, the reciters say, we remember this too as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the Venerable Bakula. Okay, now we have a number of suttas, a, a number of passages referring to Venerable Bakula's relationship, relationships with women, which are all pretty much <laughs> in the negative. In the 80 years since I went forth, I do not recall ever having grasp at the signs and features of a woman. This means you know, perceiving a woman, sort of you know, grasping at signs and features of beauty. This ties up with the sensual perception. But then he goes further. He's never taught the Dhamma to a woman, even as much as a four-line stanza. Hmm, should I take that as Mara? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> okay, so he's never taught even a four line stanza. He's never gone to the bhikkhuni's quarters and never taught the Dhamma to a bhikkhuni that's a fully ordained nun, to a female probationer that's one who's a sort of in the intermediate stage between novice and fully ordained bhikkhuni, and never taught the Dhamma to a samaniri, that's a woman novice. And so, this was one of the practices that the Buddha had laid down for the, for the Sangha of bhikkhus, that because the living quarters of the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis were separate, and the bhikkhus had, of course, as males, they had more direct access to the Buddha, and so they would get to listen to many more discourses from the Buddha than the nuns would get to, to, to hear. And so the Buddha laid down a, a rule that on the Uposita day, what we call the Poya day, that's the day of the full moon and the new moon, one of the senior bhikkhus, the more learned bhikkhus, would be assigned to go to the bhikkhuni's quarters and to teach, give a Dhamma teaching to the bhikkhunis together with the, what's here called the probationers or the trainees and the novice nuns. And this is called the bhikkhuni ovada, the instruction to the bhikkhunis. And generally the elder, learned monks would rotate in those, that responsibility. So, Venerable Ananda took on that job quite often, and then you'll see that there's a sutta later on in the Majjhima which is a discourse given by the monk Nandika to the bhikkhunis, called the Nandika Ovada Sutta. But, Bakala, Perhaps when the monk said, Bhante Bakula, would you like to go over to the bhikkhunis and give them the discourse today? <laughs> Not my practice. <laughs> okay, but don't think he was biased exclusively against women because he says in the next group of statements. In the 80 years since I went forth, 
I do not recall ever having given the going forth, ever having given the full admission, I'll first read, then I'll have to explain these terms, ever having given dependence, ever having had a novice wait on me. Okay, the going forth, or pabhaja, that is the novice ordination, where you, a senior monk gives a, a, a candidate for ordination, he gives him the 10 precepts of a novice monk. Then the full admission is the, well, I think it's better translated, full ordination. So that would be, you know, to give him the full ordination as a, as a bhikkhu. That is done by a community of monks presided over by a preceptor. Then having given the dependence, that means that according to the rules or regulations of the Vinaya, a one who receives the full ordination during the first five years has to live in dependence on or under the guidance of a senior monk. And similarly for a nun, I think it's three years, two years, a three years guidance for a, a junior nun because she spends two years as a probationer. So then I think it's three years of dependence or guidance for a junior nun. And then having had a novice wait on him that has taken a novice as his personal attendant. So Venerable Bakula seems to have been a very solitary type of monk who didn't want to have close relationship with the other monks. Okay, then come another series of passages which again sort of reinforce the idea of the ascetic temperament of Pakula. Okay, in the 80 years since I went forth, I do not recall ever having bathed in a bathhouse, ever having bathed with bath powder. Okay, so it doesn't mean that he never took a bath. You know, that would be quite offensive, I think, for other people. And also, after 80 years, his body would have been covered with dust and dirt and mud and dry and mixed with sweat. But, <laughs> what's so funny? <laughs> Doesn't need a, a robe. But there would be two ways to take, at least two ways to take baths. One, many of the monasteries would have a bathhouse in which they would fill a kind of tub with water and then they would heat up the water and then you go to the bathhouse and you bathe there. The other way is to go down to a river, a creek, a pond and bathe or to a well and bathe there. So apparently, Venerable Bakula would only go to rivers and ponds and creeks to bathe, not using the bathhouse, the convenient bathhouse at the monastery. And then bath powder would be, nowadays of course we use soap. In those days I don't think, I think soap was invented maybe in the 19th century, 18th or 19th century. But they would use some kind of powder fragrant powder that they would smash. Well, powder is already fragments, but they would take the powder and then use it to bathe themselves. It would be the equivalent of soap today. So he must have used, I don't know, to get the sweat and dirt off, maybe just clay or whatever was around. Okay, he never would give a massage to his fellow monks. And now this is why he was said to be the monk foremost in good health. He never had any affliction, as any kind of illness arise in him, even for the time it takes to milk a cow. 
He's never carried medicine around, even so much as a piece of gallnut. A p gallnut, this is what they call aralu in Sri Lanka. It's a kind of small fruit which is dried and then it has certain medicinal properties for its use for upset stomach, constipation, fevers maybe? Is it Aralu? It's Aralu, yeah. Yeah, it's a very a common ingredient in the Ayurvedic medicine. Okay, he's never used a bolster. That would be something to prop up his body when he's sitting on the bed. He doesn't recall ever having made up a bed. Well, I think I come close to... <laughs> And I remember one of my students once said, what is the reason for making up the bed when one is just going to go back to sleep in it the next night? <laughs> Excuse me? Yeah. <laughs> you just leave it the way it is when you wake up and then it's so already un unfolded when you're ready to go to sleep. You don't have to <laughs> cover up the sheet and then pull it down again. This is a noble quality. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I guess some of us can pride ourselves on having a wonderful and marvelous quality. <laughs> okay, then he never recalls entering a residence for the rains in a dwelling inside a village. And so during the rains period, when it's raining for the three months, the Buddha has laid down the rule that the monks have to stop their wandering during this period, and they have to take up a fixed residence. They have to live in a place where they'll have a roof over their head to protect themselves from the rain. And so they could live either in a forest monastery or in a village monastery. And so Bakula says that he's never stayed inside a village, never inside a village monastery, never accepting the invitation from lay people to spend the rains retreat in their house. Sometimes lay people will build a little cottage or a hut on their property inside the village and they'll invite the monk to stay there but he's never done that. He's always stayed in the forest during the rains retreat. Okay, then finally, paragraph 38, Bakula makes, sort of concludes this part of the discourse with his declaration of arahatship. He says, for seven days after going forth I ate the country's alms food as a debtor. On the eighth day, final knowledge or liberating knowledge arose. Okay, what is meant by eating the alms food as a debtor? Okay, so this is an idea that comes down, it gets elaborated in the commentaries that you see, the word arahat literally well, it comes from the verb arahati, which means to be worthy, to be deserving. And it's used, sort of the root idea is that one is worthy of the offerings of people. So what really makes one worthy to receive the offerings is that one has achieved liberating knowledge, one has eliminated all the defilements, one has gained liberation from the cycle of birth and death. But until one reaches that attainment, when we receive the offerings of people, robes, alms food, living quarters, medicines, other offerings, we're doing so as a debtor. 
sort of, we're not really fully worthy of the offerings yet, but they're supporting us in, on the principle that we have entered the practice that leads to this attainment. But to make ourselves fully worthy, we have to reach the goal. And so as long as we are still have ignorance, defilements, deluded ideas and, and views in the mind, we are debtors, indebted to the lay people who make the offerings to us. But it's when one gains liberation that one becomes entitled, fully entitled to the offerings. And so Bakula says that after he became a monk, he had to practice just for seven days. Then on the eighth day, he achieved the goal. So now he's 80 years, he's been an arahat. Okay, so now the, monk, the reciters all declare this as a wonderful quality of Venerable Bakula. Okay, then comes a certain stock passage when somebody is very impressed by the teaching and then they want to go forth. So here the naked ascetic Kasapa says that he wants to receive the going forth in this Dhamman discipline. He wants to receive the full ordination. Then he receives the going forth and he receives the full ordination. Of course, not from Venerable Bakula, but Venerable Bakula probably would have pointed him to the, the nearby monastery and Achela Kasapa would have gotten the ordination there. And then he dwells alone, dil diligent, ardent, withdrawn, resolute, and he achieves the final goal, arahatship. That's a little sort of detour from the main part of the sutta. But now, paragraph 40, we return to the account of Venerable Bakula. And it says, then on a later occasion, the Venerable Bakula took a key and went from dwelling to dwelling. That's in the monastery where he's staying. And he says, come, come out, come out, Venerable Sirs. Today I shall attain final Nibbana. So this is a particular ability that occurs to some, well, not only arhats, but even advanced, very accomplished meditators, that they can know the time, the day and time that they're going to pass away. That just occurs to them in their meditation, and they could announce it beforehand. And so Bakula must have become aware that that particular day and such and such a time, his sort of life-sustaining karma, which had carried him through 160 years, was now about to become exhausted. And so he wants the other monks to come to witness his passing away. And so then, Venerable Bakula Seated in the midst of the Sangha of Bhikkhus, he attained final Nibbana. Yeah, according to the commentary, Venerable Bakula, because his lifestyle was very simple and not demanding on others, he didn't want to leave the other monks with the burden of having to take care of his cremation. So when he passed away, in the process of passing away, what he did was to enter into meditation on the fire casino. And using the fire casino, that is the sort of visualized, visualizing fire as his object, he directed that fire towards his body and had his whole body burn up right after he passed away. 
and so there would be no uh, corpse remaining behind. The body just was reduced to ashes, and then the ashes settled on the ground and nothing else was left. And so then the monks, all the compilers of the discourse say that seated in the midst of the Sangha of Bhikkhus, the Venerable Bakula attained final Nibbana. This too we re remember as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the Venerable Bakula. Okay, and that's the discourse. What do you make of from a As you said in the beginning, Bhante, this is uh, not something that the Buddha himself preached. So to me, I would take it with a pinch of salt, <laughs> so to say, you know, because it is not that the Buddha, it is not part yeah, of the Buddha. Yeah, I don't know that that is on, because I don't. That was just yeah. a There's a mute control that might have been pressed. No, it's on. It's on? Okay. Can you hear me now? I, I could hear you, but yeah. I'm thinking about the people in the back. Yeah. Uh, this is normally, as you said, the, the sutra starts with Eva me sutang ekam yeah. samayam bhagava sabhatyam virdi. That is, that's how I heard that such and such a place, yeah. the Buddha's discourse. But this, as you said, did, did not start that way. Yeah. Because it is uh, something that Bakula is being questioned by someone else. Yeah. So to me, I take it with a pinch of salt. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Edwin? I, th I thought that I said Edwin had the hand up. He says that in the eighth day, he, uh, he got, um, actually, uh, let me get back to the paragraph, I lost it, sorry. He got final knowledge in on the eighth day, <clears throat> but then again, he got, he, he went into uh, uh, Nirvana, which I understand Nirvana, but final um, knowledge will be uh, Bodhisattva? Bodhisattva? No, no, the final knowledge is the attainment of our of our hardship. So, so when he goes out at the end, he says he reaches a final nibbana. So, what would be the difference? Oh, you see, when he attains final knowledge, he still continues to live on. In fact, he's lived on now for 80 years. Mm -hmm. But through the attainment of final knowledge, he's eradicated all the defilements. So now he's fully liberated in mind. So but his vital energy, the vital force, is still sufficient to keep him alive in good health for 80 years. So he continues to live on for 80 years. Then when he's 160, then the vital energy declines and then he passes away. But I just want to say the difference on both. Even if it's not him, on the, on the wordings, because I thought it would be the same thing. No, no, the final knowledge is the, it marks the attainment of Nibbana while alive. And then what is called here, the attainment of final Nibbana means the passing away into oh, Nibbana. Got it. The passing away without any residue of bodily existence. Thanks. Okay, I think Stacy had some comment, or, or maybe Chris, you have it? You. No, I was just saying before that um, he seemed yeah, to, to speak loud. He seemed to lack the compassion to um, use the lay people's offerings. Yeah, in fact, there is a sutta that comes in the Anguttara Nikaya, where the Buddha speaks about four types of. He says that there are four types of persons living in the world. So, what are the four? The one who lives for his own good and the good of others, the one who lives for his own good but not the good of others, the one who lives for the good of others but not for his own good, and the one who lives for the good of neither himself nor of others. And then the Buddha says, of the four types of, these four types of persons, the one who is the best, he uses a whole series of terms, the best, the foremost, the most excellent, the supreme, is the one who lives for his own good and the good of others. 
And so it seems that the ideal that the Buddha sort of posited for the Sangha is to live, of course, for one's own good, because one has to cultivate the practice oneself in order to purify oneself and to illuminate one's own mind with wisdom, but also to work for the benefit of others, particularly in the case of the monastics, by sharing the Dhamma with others. But Bakula seems to be sort of the model, almost carried to an extreme, of one who lives for his own good, but at least not explicitly for the good of others. Venerable Sagara Kantu, if you can either speak loudly or take the microphone, which is, or come up to the front. Just a quick, a quick point. Um, in this sutra, it uh, describes a person who's not an arahat who accepts the alms food as a debtor. Yeah. But in, uh, there's another sutra in the Majjhima Nikaya called the uh, Purification of Alms Food. Yeah. You know what's the name of that sutra in Pali? Um, I think it's called Pindapata Parisuddhi Sutta. And in that sutra, the Buddha says, for a bhikkhu to have to be worthy of the alms food, he has to have a finger snap of loving kindness. Oh, that's actually a very good point. That's a very, very good point. Was it in that sutta? Uh, yes. I haven't looked at that in a long time. But there are like a whole series of suttas that come in the Anguttara Nikaya, the Book of Ones, where the Buddha says that a monk who develops, it could be loving kindness, it, each, each of the Brahma Viharas, loving kindness, compassion, altruistic joy, equanimity, mindfulness of breathing, recollection of the Buddha, Dhamma Sangha, mindful. I've mentioned mindfulness of breathing, any of the meditation objects, even for the time of a finger snap, is, I think I said that he's worth, he doesn't eat the alms food in vain, I think that's what's said, which is a little different from eating, from not eating it as a debtor, one is still a debtor, but one is not eating it in vain. It, like it's still fruitful for the people who make the offerings. In fact, one has to sort of balance these two against one another. Because <laughs> if one says that one is not fully worthy unless one is an arhat, then we don't have any lay supporters. They all <laughs> turn their backs. But if the monk or nun cultivates any of these practices, even for this much, then they eat the alms food not in vain. In other words, it's beneficial for those who make the offerings. Okay, Just, and the, did you get to speak? You did, that's right. I just want, before we close, we could continue this discussion after the, um, the meal. I just wanted to point out that my former student, now a leading scholar, Bhikkhu Analeo, he has this book called Madhyama Agama Studies, in which he's studying suttas from the Chinese Madhyama Agama in relationship to their Pali counterparts. And he has a paper or an essay on the Bakala Sutta, and he makes some interesting comments here. I just wanted to read a few pa uh, passages from this paper before we close. Well, he says that the Bakala Sutta, which is evidently a later discourse, might testify to a stage in the development of the conception of an arahat where the earlier, more altruistic ideal was gradually being replaced by a growing emphasis on austere external conduct, a shift of perspective during which the arahat's detachment becomes increasingly understood 
as a form of indifference then Well, then he compares Bakula with the Venerable Mahakasapa, who also exhibits that austere, ascetic temperament. But Mahakasapa would give discourses to the monks, and he would praise, he praised the monk who is himself sort of accomplished in the ascetic practices and also encourages others to observe them. But in contrast, the Venerable Bakula doesn't encourage other monks to engage in any of the practices. So then Venerable Analio says, in the examples that we just surveyed, Mahakasapa does take an, inter an active interest in community matters and also acts as a teacher. He even goes to a nunnery to teach the nuns even though this was done at the instigation of Ananda. And so in contrast to Bakala, Mahakasapa would not have been able to proclaim <laughs> that he never entered a nunnery, that he never greeted a nun, or that he never taught a nun. And then he says, since the depiction of Bakula must stem from a period some distance after the Buddha's passing away, it seems reasonable to assume that the praises bestowed on him in the Bakula Sutta testify to a development in the conception of an arahat subsequent to the earlier ideal of the arahat reflected in the other early discourses. In fact, as the comparison with Mahakasapa shows, in other early discourses, the austeri austerity and the ascetic conduct do not require from teaching activities. In some, it seems that the arhat ideal evident in the depiction of Bakula reflects tendencies that can already be seen in some discourses related to Mahakasapa, probably representing an attitude held among a faction of the early Buddhist community. If Bakula's fellow monks had adopted a type of conduct similar to those praised in this discourse, the Buddhist monastic order would not have stood much chance of surviving. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe with this we'll end for the day and then we will come back, let us say, at, let's say, 12.30 and then we could have discussion then. Okay, so let us end with the sharing of the merits. Hey, maybe you guys share the merits. Maybe I'll leave without sharing. <laughs> I've been so inspired. <laughs> but did Venerable Bakula, perhaps Venerable Bakula, for all we know, you know, he might have been not teaching in the human realm, but radiating his merits to the Deva world and the realm of the Pratas. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let us recite the verses for sharing the merits. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu sasanang. Akasa ta chabuma ta 
Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakantu De Sanang Akasa Ta Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyantang Anumoditva Chirang Rakantu Mang Parang Etavatacham Hehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Deva Numodantu Sava Sampati Sedia Etavatacham Hehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Bhutanumodantu Sava Sampati Sedia Etavatacham Hehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe Satanumodantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Bhavagupadaya Vichihetato Etantare Satakayupapana Rupiya Rupicha Asanya Sanino Dukha Pamuchantu Pusantu Nibhutin Okay, so it, today is the, I'm always heartbroken to say this, <laughs> but this is the last class for the winter se semester. Then we come to a three month period when the monastery doesn't have public events, except January 1st, there's the interfaith prayer service to usher in the new year with wishes and prayers for world peace that is Sunday morning 10 a.m. in the Great Buddha Ho no in the Kuan Yin Hall and it's always followed by a sumptuous lunch and then there is the Chinese New Year celebration on February 19th when we have in the afternoon a recitation and hand out the blessed thread which is supposed to be the auspicious thread for the new year. Oh, I forgot one, I overlooked one line in the Bakula Sutta. In the 80 years since I went forth, I do not recall ever having tied the auspicious thread <laughs> on Chinese New Year. Gee, I've recalled tying so many auspicious threads, hundreds of them. <laughs> okay, so let us end with the three vows. <laughs>